I'd like to welcome you to the place. This is the place for intellectual, spiritual, and scriptural honesty. Uh, this is going to be a different show tonight. We're doing uh, an experiment. I mean, we even have toilets flushing in the background. I mean, you can't beat that. This is the first. And so uh, you, you may see people uh, doing different things tonight, and I hope that you can uh, just hang in there. Uh, we have a Google Hangout with various people uh, here on our show. Uh, a tonight. public Google Hangout, which means that we have no idea who's going to join this conversation. That, that, that is true. That is true. But the, the point that I want to make, and I'm not going to be that much in the conversation. I want to take a back seat. I, I really want to emphasize something that I think is really, really meaningful. And that is the New Covenant group is about atheists and theists coming together. People coming together having a respectful conversation. People coming together willing to be honest. And it's not about us against them. It's not about that at all. It's more or less about this and that. And I think Bob Graves possibly put it together best. And in a few minutes, I'm going to have him read actually what he wrote this morning because I thought that it was powerful. But before I do, I want to introduce uh, Daryl Furlow. He's in our studio in Texas. Daryl, how are you doing this evening? Good, good. Enjoying a wonderful thunderstorm outside. So if I disappear, uh, that means that uh, our lights went out. <laughs> I can understand that. Um, we've had technical difficulties all week long. Greg Bray just got his power back up. Bob had his power out all night long. And those guys are up in the uh, area of the country where they have lots of snow, hail, and Ice storms were down here, and it was 71 degrees last night, and it was almost 88 degrees here today, so we're a little bit hot and sweaty. But let's uh, not... The one technical issue that we should not be having tonight is our internet connection, which uh, was horrible Sunday, and we had to shut down our, our whole network for half the day um, just because of it, which was a, a real disappointment because uh, we had upgraded our connection to support up to 30 simultaneous Skype feeds and uh, to upload our stream to five different live streaming channels if we needed to. Uh, and we were so excited about it, and then it was worse than it had ever been, ever, ever. Um, but all that is, should now be fixed. So we hope you're enjoying the, uh, the stream. Let us know how it looks. Let us know how it's going for you. Let us know if you're having, having any problems. Um, and if you hear it, toilet flush, that's part of the show. It's not, uh, it's not a poor <laughs> internet stream. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, I want to get Bob to read that which he wrote this morning. Bob, would you read that and make a comment on that? Well, sure, yeah. Let me just begin by, by reading it. I made a blog entry this morning. The title of it is Us Versus Them or This Versus That. And uh, let me see if I can read it without sounding like I'm too dull here. Um, religious devotion to theology tends to divide people. However, a scholarly dispassionate devotion to theology tends to unite. Uh, I think the reason for this is because religious people, without realizing it, tend to think of uh, in an us versus them uh, mentality. In other words, they, they tend to think in terms of this is what we uh, Greg, it says you mu you muted Bob Graves. Yeah, that was a mistake. I was we, we were getting an echo. I was trying that's to a, stop that, but I muted the wrong feed. I that's think, an atheist so. move Bob, right there. It that's was an atheist, an atheist move. move. We're going to have to huh. get Bob to start reading that again. Go for it again, Bob. <laughs> Sorry. His Bob is still muted, Greg. Can you can you please? I unmuted him. <laughs> I, <laughs> I can't hear. Him. I muted him again. There we go. Okay. Does that work? Yeah, you're going to have right. to start all over. Uh, there he is. The atheists okay. are muted. We'll start all over Bob. again. <laughs> we'll have fun. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Religious devotion to theology tends to divide people. 
Uh, however, a scholarly, dispassionate devotion to theology tends to unite. And I think the reason for this is because religious people, without realizing it, tend to think uh, in an us opposed to them mentality. In other words, they tend to think in terms of this is what we believe and that is what they believe. They then go forward to champion their own tradition. And, but scholars, on the other hand, are not opposed to changing their mind when the facts warrant. And scholars are usually less concerned about breaking with the pack when the facts require it. Indeed, in many scholarly circles, it is considered a real accomplishment if you can formulate a different insight and win over those of a former view with the facts. So they tend to be more open to changes in perspective and open to entire paradigm shifts when that is warranted. Einstein was considered uh, a kook at first. Uh, traditional views of physics were well accepted, and what he proposed would change everything. He was actually blacklisted for a while and could not obtain a teaching position because of his non-standard views. Fortunately for him, and I think for us, the world of physics was approaching a brick wall, and when they hit it, so to speak, Einstein's views that he had published were reconsidered. And of course, the rest is history, and today physics has moved well beyond where Einstein even brought it. So, uh, but such changes have yet to really become the norm for theists. People of faith still tend to overly be overly focused on us versus them, even when they don't realize that's what they're doing. And one of the reasons uh, that I've liked being a part of the New Covenant group here is that uh, the group wants to give voice to all points of view. We want to face all of the questions without uh, creating barriers as much as is possible. And when we discuss theology, we're not so much interested in us versus them as we are uh, in, in this versus that in our mentality. When dealing with people who have different opinions about God, Jesus, the Bible, and such things, we don't have to believe that they are the enemy. Uh, if there are any problems, those problems are not to be found in them or us as much as those problems are to be found in this or that. So if you're trying to make more sense of Christian thought, I would encourage you to reconsider if you are operating on an us versus them modality or a this versus that modality. And that's uh, basically what I said in my blog this this morning. Wow, that's that's awesome. Uh, Greg, why don't, you, why don't you introduce everyone in the uh, Hangout? Well, um, and I apologize uh, because I may have muted Nick. We'll see what happened there. Um, but we do have Nick Albertini, uh, who was, I believe, the second guest I ever had on Inspiring Honesty. He is a a friend, and um, they I don't want to describe him in a way that, that doesn't do exact justice to, to how he would describe himself, but a very intelligent person with a, a wonderful understanding of um, – physics and of mathematics and complex systems theory. Uh, so um, he, he is going to be a great addition to this conversation. We also have Dennis. And Dennis, I, I have never really actually learned how to say your last name properly. Um, Scoozy. <laughs> Scoozy? Yeah. Uh, all right. right. So, the, the new covenant okay. group uh, renamed him. His last name used to be Scouse, but he has formally accepted Scoozy as his last name. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good, good. So, um, of course, Dennis has been on uh, multiple shows of ours, and he's uh, broadcasting from the Netherlands. Uh, I have had many personal conversations with Dennis, and I'm looking forward to having him be a part of this conversation here. Of course, we all know Bob. And Ariel, I'm sorry, I'm not particularly familiar with who you are to give you an introduction. So uh, I think it might be best to let you do that yourself. Sure. Um, I'm a pastor's son, so I was raised in the church, raised very religiously, although my dad is actually more of a scholarly type person, so he's actually a happy Christian, <laughs> as opposed to one who's resistant to all other ideas. And um, But it's I'm just starting to come into some more openness myself. A um, bit about me. Um, I spent the last six months intensively researching uh, the psychology of relationships, and that's been also um, so. That's that's my area of interest. But then, as it pertains to the gospel, because it's always been such a key part of my life, and uh, and, it, and a totally confusing and contradictory and ineffective experience at that. So, can I ask what 
what kind of pastors are dead? You said scholarly, but what uh, school of thought or what de denomination or? And good question, actually, because like I would say he's so broad minded that he's he's been in the mall. Um, but he would be more grace oriented. Um, but then he, he he tends to steer clear of taking a position when he actually speaks. But right now he's speaking for a non-denominational um, church, and the other two pastors are reformed, or they're, they're, they were formerly Jewish, and then now they're they're more uh, grace grace message. Now, in some areas of the country, grace uh, is either a radical universalism or a radical Calvinism. Which, um, are, you know, which one are you making reference to? I think it's um, now that I'm. I think it's a form of universalism, where God saves all, but then with varying levels of reward, uh -huh. depending on how the what kind of life there was. I like that. I like that because I, I want the most reward. Um, Ariel, tell me uh, first of all, uh, how did you how did you run across the New Covenant Group? Well, um, let's see here. I'll try and make this short. I started uh, dating a gal. Uh, it seemed like the more I revealed about myself, the worse the relationship got. And um, and I started realizing I'd never really discussed Christianity before, and I started realizing I hated what I thought I believed. And it wasn't working. It was making me feel condemned and guilty and all this. And and then I started connecting into more of a grace message that started with Perry Teresis out of Australia and uh, finally connecting into Keane through another guy that kind of got disgruntled with the church here in London. So, And here I am. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Awesome. Well, let me just let me just uh, let you know. Uh, I don't know how long you've been watching our shows, but there's a lot of diverse opinions here. We have two atheists, um, several theists, um, and um, you know we want you to get a, a little aggressive if you have an opinion. We want you to jump in and express it. Okay. Great. Hey, thank you. All right. Back to you, Dr. Jones. Uh, one of the things that we want to do is we want to do a trial here, and uh, I asked Joey and. Greg to do this in our production meeting the other day that is Monday and it turned out to be wonderful and so I want them simply to pick a topic and let's see if we can create the kind of tension that needs to be in a good conversation and yet it needs to remain extremely respectful and kind and so I'm going to turn it to you and Greg and see if you guys can turn up the heat a little bit. All right, Greg, I suggest that the topic is uh, who is better, Greg or Joey? Are we talking about looking or just in an overall category? Because I win both, but it's good to, to make the distinction. That was quick. What, uh, what topic would you like to talk about? I, I really don't know. We have a diverse crowd here, um, which I think is fantastic. It helps to uh, really bring... A, a, we we actually just got a new addition, so um, I, I have to apologize. I, I think I called uh, um, uh, Nick an atheist. Uh, he's not an atheist. Uh, no, no, yeah. Nick is not. I, yeah. I believe I am the only atheist represented um, in this conversation. So all right, um, let's see. Techni technically, I think I am an atheist. Are you? Well, uh, I'm a deist. I I don't really believe in. Uh, Theism, which would be God intervening in the uh, affairs of mankind. So, very good, very good. Okay. I, uh, and Nick, you sort of stri you you walk that line. It's not really fair to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you got a foot in either camp. Uh, but I don't know. There's there's a lot of different things that we could discuss today, and uh, a lot of directions that we could go. But I like the idea of using Google Plus. Uh, Hangouts and and sort of our concept when I was uh, pitching the idea of using them because I like them is to make sort of a more casual feel similar to um, what you might get if you were sitting around in a pub and just talking with your friends um, about something intellectual. So that's why uh, a couple of us have our drinks here today and mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we are uh, doing our best to keep this casual but we wanted to pick a good topic that can interest all of us so 
Well, I don't know. We we exactly could um, we could pick up on the topic that we were discussing Monday, which is um, uh, you made the um, uh, genius assertion that the Bible was one hundred percent mythology. I did. That this was one, and it's important, of course, when we make these assertions to realize that uh, everything that we're saying is going to be torn apart for technicality. So, um, the topic that we discussed, uh, yeah, the technicality our, being our every letter that Paul wrote. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, was essentially if we we take anything from Genesis through Acts and include Revelation as well, there's nothing in that that it cannot be considered mythology. Now, of course, we, when we had this conversation, nobody brought up uh, Proverbs or Psalms, which are obviously poetry um, mm -hmm. and a list of Proverbs as well. So um, th those would not be mythology either, but any of the stories um, in the Bible about things that happened, I believe, count as mythology. Well, let's talk about now, a set... by mythology, uh, you define mythology. First, let's talk about a set of books, okay? Instead of, a, instead of picking uh, and choosing, let's just say Genesis through to, um, how far should we go, Dr. Pentateuch. Jones? Well, first sure. of all, I, I think that um, mythology needs to be defined. I do want to define mythology, okay. but but let's let's define both. Let, let's define a mm -hmm. range of books, and then let's define what 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 is meant by a mythology. Okay, are we going to pick on the Protestant canon? Is that yes, Protestant okay. canon. Protestant canon. <laughs> let's take uh, the book of Genesis through Malachi. All right, or Malachi has a. Uh, Everybody else, but Dr. Jones says. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, I was like, malarkey. <laughs> bunch of malarkey over here. Well, he's uh, that's what you get when you bring a, a Hebrew linguist into the conversation. Um, uh, okay, so Genesis through Malachi, and uh, back to Bob's question: uh, How are we defining mythology? Uh, I will define mythology as stories that are not historical. They are representative of a. A history in a way but they they I don't know it, it's difficult without pulling out like a Joseph um, Campbell book here to actually give a definition of what mythology means but realistically it's it's following archetypes and telling stories to convey greater points and truths without a lot of regard to the reality uh, or, or the historical accuracy of those stories that would be how I define mythology. All right. So your assertion is Genesis through Malachi is 100% that. Yes. All right. Any comments? And it should be considered that. One Can it be that um, uh, what I've heard of a philosopher, Alan Watts, was like that he says, mythology is more like an image, like no example. Is that possible, correct, to make some points? Sure. I, I, now, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not saying that mythology doesn't have any value. I'm just saying that mm -hmm. we need to realize that it, the value that it comes from is a mythological value, or that comes from it. We, and the people who treat the Bible as anything more than mythology mm -hmm. are doing an injustice to the reality of the Bible. Right. What do you think about that, Nick? Do you, do you agree or disagree? Mm -hmm. Well, so uh, my question is, uh, you cite archetypes. And to me, uh, the question is, was which came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, uh, what we consider archetypes are very much influenced by uh, stuff in the Bible, uh, since it has so much to do with Western civilization and our development of our own mythology over the course of time. Where do our archetypes come from? Many of them, I think, really come from the Bible. So. The creation of archetypes versus the expression of archetypes that were previously uh, in existence, right? That that's sort of where my quest my question lies with that definition of mythology. I agree that most of it is mythology. I do think that there are historical components, and there have to be people who created this mythology. You know, they created it uh, to explain historical uh, things of significance. So. I don't know. Yeah, if I, I could jump in. If I could jump in, I'd, I'd say that uh, I think the book of Ruth would would be an, an excellent example of a book that I think, as I look at it, I think it's about an actual historical person named Ruth. 
-hmm. However, I think that Ruth had this impact on her culture uh, in a manner where they finally kind of embodied it into a drama mentory, you know, <laughs> of this book that is embellished with the people's names and the various events told in a manner that, that helps to solidify and clarify the impact she had. So I would say I think that she really existed, and I think that she also actually, um, uh, you know, we had this impact on the country, but I don't think that the book is factual in everything that it has to say. So I, you know, so it's kind of like an admixture, and and of course it came from a culture that didn't care whether or not the story had all the facts, you know. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that I, I, if I can jump in, like Greg, and please, of, Ariel, jump in at any time. Yeah. For the record, like, I was having a discussion. Um, and I keep going back to this point of like, you know, there's that verse where Paul says, all scripture is God breathed and inspired and useful. But a lot of people take that to mean that, 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 um, I think much further where it becomes, that becomes the only communication of God. And then if it, it in any way contradicts anything, you know, that's in the Bible, it becomes, you know, it becomes the, the thing to resist. Yeah. Of course, if Jesus could tell a parable about a certain man in a certain city, uh, then why can't uh, the Bible contain uh, a myth about Job? And, and, and uh, I, I, another example is I think, uh, you know, uh, when we see uh, the prophet who tells us all about what God is going to do to uh, destroy the, the, the city and, and then he ends up getting, uh, you know, Jonah gets swallowed by the fish. I really think that's a total story, but I think Jonah really told that story so that he could make himself the bad guy uh, in a story that people would enjoy hearing, but he really had a point to be made so that I see him as an historical figure who told a story. And I think it's a very useful story. So the fact that this mentality, oh, if it's really not, although I wouldn't see it as the inspired word of God the way fundamentalists would, uh, it doesn't mean it has to be some sort of literal non-mythological element. I mean, you know, it is Let God me, in a box like that. But, but the, Let me but clarify the, one more thing about the, uh, the mythology statement is that one of the things that I, I mean when I say that the Bible is mythology is it's actually to give it a bit of credit. Um, and a lot of people think that that would be, a, you know, it's meant as a derisive statement. But realistically, you know, Bob has said that uh, he believes that, you know, Jonah was a historical person. Ruth was a historical person. My assertion with the label of mythology is that it doesn't matter. Historical or not, these stories have value and they're not something that are, are, are just completely throw away. I mean, we can, and Nick, you brought up uh, archetypes and there are plenty of other ones. We've got the, the Bhagavad Gita and and um, the Odyssey, the Iliad, uh, other things that came from um, that area and other areas that there obviously are recurring themes and the themes very frequently uh, reflect natural cycles, birth, death. Um, they address the, the seasons, the, the changing of the world around them. And they, they help to illustrate points through anthropomorphized and personified stories. So sometimes it's just easier to convey a point. Say, for example, the story of Job. Doesn't matter if Job was a historical person. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go on record and saying I don't believe that Job was a historical person. I, I think that it's a story that conveys a good point about not being too arrogant, not accepting your uh, um, blessings mm -hmm. or not taking them for granted. And uh, being humble and mm -hmm. recognizing that bad things are going to happen and that there's good ways to cope with them and bad ways. But let me let me ask a question mm -hmm. here. How is uh, the Bible from Genesis to Malachi mythology in a way that, say, any book about the Civil War is not mythology? Mm, good point. I like that. Because, Joey, I think that the, the point that I just made is the, the reason that it is significant is because a book about the Civil War um, is claiming to be historical. And if the Civil War didn't happen, um, 
then that's a pretty big issue. Whereas the stories in the Bible, it, if we consider them to be mythology, then the historicity of it can be entirely disregarded without changing the meaning of the stories. And that's one of the beneficial aspects. But there are books within mythology. that range that do claim to be historical, such as, for example, the Book of Chronicles. Right. Well, if you go back to the original premise um, of, like, you know, Christians view the Bible as historical. Atheists might think that it's not historical. And and then look at it from the, the, the frame of, you know, what specific values do we pull from it and how do we apply those values? Because, sure, I could watch uh, the Odyssey and learn something about, um, you know, I'm... Uh, the beauty of love. You know, it. Or the glory of, of um, ambition. And then get inspired to do my own life. You're right. I, and that's, the, that's exactly what I'm speaking to when I talk about mythology is that I, I mean, I think we can agree that the, the Iliad and the Odyssey are not historical stories, but that doesn't mean that they're not inspiring. Nick, uh, Greg, I have a question. It's it's a simple one. Oh. If the if we Greg look, just said uh oh. <laughs> what do you mean? Oh. Just said, uh -oh. No, uh -oh. actually, it was Nick. Nick had raised his hand. Um, oh. Okay, go ahead, Nick. I, I won't interrupt you. Go for it. Uh, so uh, I've got I've got a I've got a theory. Uh, I want to try to explain it very quickly. Um, I have a theory that. Uh, the the whole story about the exodus the exodus from Egypt was mythology and it had to do with uh, the idea and and we, we get a lot of this from the Bible so it's it's hard to you know it's hard to say where the original sort of history is if there is any history to it uh, but so Abraham was from Babylon according to the Bible. And the exodus from Egypt never happened, according to uh, uh, history. Archaeology, history, yeah. Yeah. So the idea of the exodus seems to me uh, to, to refer to the Atenites, right, mm -hmm. who were expelled from Egypt uh, under uh, Tutankhamun, whose uh, uh, original name was uh, uh, Tutank Amun, uh, sorry, not Tutank Amun, but uh, uh, Tutank uh, Aten and was changed and then the Athenites were expelled they had already tried to expel the priests of Amun and you know so so this whole concept of the captivity in Egypt and the uh, expulsion of uh, under the exodus right with Moses all of that sort of seems to me to be an explanation of two monotheistic groups that got together in Canaan, uh, some of them Egyptian, some of them originally Babylonian, uh, and that's where we get the story of the Exodus. So, I mean, I, I think that there is historical fact involved in the creation of these myths, but they're not, necess not, they're not necessarily historical. If this all is, if, if this whole Bible is mythical or the books we just met, that uh, is not only the thing that it's just created to show some points, to learn something from it, like that. I, I think this is what Greg is 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 claiming. Greg, oh, yeah, I'm, okay. saying, I'm sorry that okay. I'm saying there's historical anthropological needs that are represented there as well. So if you consider there are two cultures, distinct cultures that are both monotheistic, they find themselves in the same place. And in this time, um, blood ties are everything. So to, to come up with a story that somehow ties them together through blood is very important to them. And this is why the Exodus and the Passover and all of these things become so incorporated, I think, into Jewish tradition. Well, that's a very anthropological argument that you're making, and I will, I, I'll agree. I mean, I don't know that it's true, but I, I, it's certainly plausible and it makes a lot of sense. Um, the, the main point of that, it once again, comes down to the historicity of things like the Exodus 
are not what were important in the creation of the stories even i mean that's that was not a significant well, factor I, I think that it may be significant to think that uh, there was analogy to actual history and and of course we're talking about a day where did history even matter i can't picture you know 3000 mm -hmm. 4000 years ago that you know given i mean today look at the technology the way it bursts and booms the kind of computers and the technology we're talking on google hangouts now we couldn't do this 2 years ago um you know when my grandmother was born we we didn't have cars and when she died you know we got jet airplanes and all that. um but in that day you know i'm sorry but this generation upon generation upon generation would continue on and 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 at best you've got a few different metal alloys you know mm -hmm. um and so history didn't really matter, but so I but I do think that that he experienced did, and so I do think that some of these aspects of the Old Testament history are are mythologically embellished, so as to tell the story with clearer impact of something they really did experience. So there's a there's a historical motivation to it, and a and a identity of self purpose behind it. But the story itself, I don't think, can be taken as historically accurate. Okay, so two things. Number one, is there anybody in the Hangout that is not wearing earbuds? We all... Everybody's wearing earbuds? I wonder where that echo is coming from. It's okay. coming from Nick. That's why I keep muting him. I don't know why he, it's coming from him, but okay. it is. <laughs> My phone is background. I can tell you there's a little bar that shows that the sound is coming from you when I'm talking or anybody right. else is talking. All right, so, so uh, just your microphone then dis up, disregard but. that. Maybe maybe Nick can work it out. But uh, the next thing is uh, Dr. Jones had a question, so I'm going to pass that over to him. Uh, just out of curiosity, it sounds like we're talking about a Protestant model of the Old Testament. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it yeah, doesn't sound like yeah. we're talking so much about the Catholic model, and it, it's completely mm -hmm. foreign to the Jewish model of the yes. Old Covenant. Uh, and they wouldn't even call it the Old Covenant. And so my question would be, if we look at the text itself, and we realize that the writing system is an ob job, and this may sound like a broken record, but if it has been pointed for different times and if all of these pointing systems are diametrically opposed to each other in various ways how can we actually make an assessment about what it actually says much less make the judgment that it is mythology or anything else and let me follow with another thought if we take like uh, Ariel, I think he made the comment on Second Timothy chapter fifteen and sixteen. Roll, did you just roll your tongue when you pronounced his name? Ari, did you say Ariel? Well, you're supposed to trill the R a, in a, a Greek, and I normally okay. do that. I sorry, go ahead. I ask you I to just, forgive me. I have sinned. I go ahead. Come short of the glory of Joey. Go ahead with your comment. <laughs> <laughs> but in Second Timothy, one of the things that happens is, you know, in Paul's usage, he uses a, a term. He says. He era, and then he says gramata. Now he's talking about esoteric, uh, an esoteric system of writing, and so we're talking about a writing of bias. We could talk, call it a sacred writing, if you will. But by the time that we look at verse sixteen, he says pasagra the omnustas, which he takes it in a much different direction. And so uh, the apostle Paul is dealing with two different elements. He's talking about something that is extremely biased, but he's practicing this, this writing system based upon the principles of oral tradition and modeling. He's not reading the text itself because every person who quotes the Old Testament never quotes it in context or verbatim. It's so foreign to the concepts right. of the old. And so... This is very, very troubling. And so what we're talking about here in an extreme way is extremely synthetic. And so my question would be, how can we actually call it, namely the Abjad mythology, when we don't know X, Y, or Z about 
any of the author's intent. And, l- and let me add that uh, we did say at the beginning of this discussion that we were confining this to the Protestant canon, but I understood that to mean um, the books that have been yeah. chosen for that, um, and I don't think that uh, I, I, I would the accept. Pro- the I, I would. I would accept your. I would accept Ob job. Yes, and I would accept your argument because we're not saying that that we can't talk about any form of these books, such as the 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 origins from which they came. Uh, but that we wouldn't be talking about any books that would not be included in that uh, mm-hmm. canon. So that's but, w- for that reason, I would accept what but, you're saying. But my question is, is it good science to say this is mythology when we can't understand any of it mm-hmm. accurately speaking? I agree speaking? with that. I agree with that premise. Because none of the Jews look at it as an accuracy model. They look right. at it just like we look at abstract art. And so mm-hmm. the the Protestants have made an accuracy model of something that you can't do. And it seems like in this discussion, we might be committing the same, you know, logical fallacy that the Protestants. Well, have. Dr. Jones, I'd say that actually, I think what you're saying speaks even stronger to my point. If the, the Hebrew people looked at this as an abstract art form and uh, an oral history, then it just once again reiterates the fact that it should not be taken with or as more than stories and stories that that convey differing okay but I, I but yeah i'd see it as a as an admixture of story we the, the the concept of myth has a variety of implications that you can't erase from the word myth even when we try to use the word myth in a more proper uh, anthropological way it still always conveys the idea of, oh, you're just making stuff up. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I don't that's think that that's... That's not what I mean by it. Right. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> and, and, and I think that that's part of the problem that we want to, that, that I would want to clarify, that mm-hmm. I don't see any part of it as necessarily requiring that it be absolutely historical. But I do think that what provoked it was mm-hmm. a real history that we mm-hmm. don't know what that real history was, you know. And, and actually, right. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, go ahead. That's all I was going to say. Well, I remember in grade 11 religion, Catholic high school, there the, 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 the teacher's main premise was what you just said. Mm-hmm. And in the Protestant tradition, it's more literal, which has its fallacies too. In, so my, in, mm-hmm. in a in, modern day, too many people try to take the Bible and deal with it and make conclusions about it as if the people who wrote it had the exact same view of reality that we have. <laughs> and mm-hmm. and but, they didn't. And there's some ways in which we don't even know really what their view of reality was. So we don't even really, uh, abjads aside, we don't even know what their view of reality was entirely so that we don't really know what they saw as the actual um, character of these writings. Let, let me let me throw this in as well. Um, uh, you know, we, we uh, tried to define mythology at the beginning of this discussion. Um, I'm not sure I was completely clear on what was it, what was meant, but I don't think that we should throw out the idea of author intent. Um, and that's the reason why I compared the Bible to a book on the Civil War, or I might even compare it to uh, the stories of Hercules, for example. How is the how is the quote the, the the alleged mythology of the Bible like the stories of Hercules? Because when you when you compare it to that, for example, the intent of the author was to tell a mythology that made that made a point, whereas. Um, Mm-hmm. Objot or not, I'm not convinced that uh, that the intent of these authors, uh, or not all of them, uh, was to spin a mythology. Now, th- I think there's a difference between a mythology and a false history, or a mythology mm-hmm. and an exaggerated history. Uh, but, um, but um, you know, and you can argue whether these histories were true or false. But as but as to the intent of the author being mythology, I don't think that you can. I don't think that you can say with 100% assurity that that was their intent. Uh, and because of Dr. Jones's comment about an objot, I think it makes it even more difficult. Um, having said that, uh, there's, uh, there's a couple people who haven't spoken in this conversation. Uh, I'd like to, uh, to find out if, uh, if our Texas studio, uh, Daryl, uh, do you have anything to add? Well, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I turned my microphone off because I heard you make a comment about the Headphones. I, I don't have headphones here, and I think we may have been getting some feedback from here. I don't know. 
But I did have a comment. Um, you know, I was thinking about the whether it's a possibility or turns out to be a fact uh, concerning most of what we have in what we call the Old Testament being mythology. Uh, in in my estimation, I think we would probably be better off if it turned out to be the case, because it seems like what it does or has done more than anything else is promote a lot of hostility and a lot of division uh, because of a god or certain gods. And uh, so, I, like I said, I was just sitting here thinking about that and um, thought I might throw that out there, see what anybody thought. Very good. Um, we are uh, getting close to the end here. We, we ran late starting, so uh, I'm, we're going to run late ending as well. Um, uh, we have a new person uh, in, in the Hangout. My heart always skips a beat, by the way, when a new person joins the Hangout right in the middle of the show. <laughs> never know what's going to happen. We had somebody that joined for a uh, moment that was yeah. Jack BM. I was really yeah. worried yeah, that, what was going to uh, show up on the screen. No idea what that means. I'm th I thank God that his camera was black. Um, but we, uh, we have an, a, another, another, dangerous, another dangerous, unpredictable person joined, and that's Troy. I almost had him booted, but uh, but uh, Troy, um, do you have anything to uh, to add to the conversation before I before I throw you out of the hangout? <laughs> Is it just his picture? Troy, yeah, it we can, can hear you, it. Troy. We we can hear yeah. when you type. So if you speak, we can probably hear you. You can hear me. We oh can yeah. Hear me. Oh yeah, Troy. We've heard everything that you've said. Yeah. And in fact, right. we hope that you heard Greg admit that he doesn't know Jack. <laughs> I haven't really been listening. I've been trying to figure out how to get my camera going. It, there is a little gear in the top right corner that might help. So yeah, much I weird stuff. Can't hear here. you. <laughs> Ariel is, technology uh, is, work? is collapsing in laughter. Uh, <laughs> we might have to call the hospital. Oh now, Troy, goodness. aren't you this working with like lasers uh, and physics? I'm, I'm just saying, shouldn't you be able to figure this out? Well. I mean, lasers, computers, they seem related. <laughs> Not really. Troy, do you, uh, let's forget about your camera. Do you, have you been listening? Do you have anything to, to, to throw into the conversation before we, uh, before I've, we finish? I've honestly been very enmeshed in the, the settings dilemma that I have, and I haven't really been paying too much attention. Oh, I got you. All right. Uh, I expected as much, to be honest. Um, <laughs> he is another atheist. Yeah, uh, so. You know, Troy, I was going to I was gonna mention to you that I've noticed that sometimes with Google Hangouts, if you don't have a camera active before you start Chrome or the, or the browser, it won't register the camera. It, it finds the camera when the browser starts. And so if you start the browser, then start the camera and come into Google Hangouts, you can't get your camera going. Well, I'll restart Chrome, then I'll be back in a second. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so let's go back to the free for all. Uh, Anybody yeah, else have anything to uh, to add to what Daryl said, or um, Nick? Just, are you muted just, again? Just no, continue. you're not. You I, can talk. I just unmuted it. Yeah. Okay. I'll keep it muted when I'm not uh, talk. Um, I don't know. I mean, there there's some stuff in the Old Testament that is not. Uh, purporting to be historical. I mean, one of my favorite books in the Old Testament uh, is the book of Proverbs. I love the book of Proverbs. Yes, but it's I been excluded. It's, it's been excluded. Huh? What? We went does up it, to does Malachi does it, does it, or Malachi. Doesn't Proverbs come after Malachi? Well, that's in there. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I thought I, I completely oh, forgot yeah. the order then. Like I mean, right I mean, the, the debate is King. over. If Proverbs anyway. has been included, then it is over. The, uh, the, uh, Proverbs is not Proverbs. mythology. I'm saying Proverbs, Proverbs does not purport to be uh, anything more than a book of saints. And I, I, frankly, right. uh, including all of the Gnostic Gospels found since 1947 and things like this, I really think that, that personally anyway, I like books of saints more yes. than anything else coming out of that tradition. I, I However, uh, Greg, Greg did explicitly say before we began this conversation that if you include Proverbs, there's a problem. So, so I would, I would, I would oh. give that because it, literally the conversation is over, in my opinion, if we, if we, if we include that. So, I think well, the Joey, interest, I want to address sake your point directly when you were saying that, uh, that you know if we compare them to the stories of Hercules, then there may be some that might fit that bill. Um, you know, I immediately think of Daniel and the Lion's Den or things sure. of that nature. That uh, so I will I will give you I will grant you that some of of the uh, the Bible uh, can I, I certainly could not argue that it that it isn't uh, a form of mythology uh, but um, 
but I, I don't think I can street. grant you that all of all of the range in which we have 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 included in this discussion is uh, is is mythology, especially when you can when you consider what is at least the likely intent of the authors who who wrote these books. I, I would even want to add that we see, you know, as in English, we have different kinds of literature. We have we have poetry, we have children's stories, we have uh, mysteries, we have. Uh, we we have dramas, we have love stories, we have uh, pornography. We got we have all sorts of genres of. I'm pretty uh, sure there's some literature. of that in the Bible too. Oh yeah, there is, and um, and and I think that we see in the Old Testament, although the genres there may be different than those in our own culture, I think we see a a book rich with a variety of genres, and to think that every single genre is merely another form of myth. I I think that's a hard argument to make, even I, uh, because I don't think a culture could do that, even if they wanted to. Uh, it strikes me as being something anthropologically difficult to do. So, with all those different types of literature there, um, I, I I I would say that they certainly may vary in accuracy, and no doubt some of them are. I, I see. I see Jonah as being a deliberately a story. I see I see Job as absolutely a wonderful uh, novelette, uh, and I see Genesis as really um, uh, more of an extended parable uh, to try to give us a model to work with because we don't know what the hell happened. See, you know? Bob, and, don't you think that if yeah. it before we say that anything in within the Bible is mythology that we must first establish that the author intended it to be fiction? Uh, well, I don't know. I'm not sure because I don't think that their sense of, I don't think they made the demarcation between fiction and nonfiction the way we do. Really? Uh, I, I, I don't think that they did. I think that uh, mm. their history had a purpose of giving identity, not of giving the facts of who, what, where, when, why. Uh, and as a result, if they altered and modified the facts to clarify the identity they drove from it, I, didn't, I don't think they saw that as a faux pas. Well, and Joey, I think we also need to address the, the reality that the author of these manuscripts is not the originator of the story in nearly any case. Um, that mm -hmm. for the most part, what we have is people that finally put to paper right. what has been a longstanding oral tradition. So even if that author thought that it was a literal fact doesn't mean that it is okay but but again there, there's a difference between the the there's a difference story. between somebody who intended to write a fiction and somebody who who uh who who took an oral tradition and wrote it down believing it to be true uh, that that does in my opinion doesn't automatically make it mythology Myth mythology in, in at least uh, i uh, the way i understand it you you must include the idea that the person who spun this, the person who wrote this, in in only intended it to, to, to make a teaching point or to or to lead people forward that they did that it wasn't valuable to them as to whether these stories were true or not. I take Bob's point, but at the same time, I think that if you told um, uh, that that if you uh, uh, a, accuse these authors uh, to their face of not telling the truth, that they that they might that they might take issue with that. At least some of them. You know, since the Old Nick Testament. has something he'd like to say too. He's got his age. Doctor Jones. Every time you try to talk, Nick has his hand raised. <laughs> okay, Sorry. that's an extra. Sorry, I'm raising my I'm raising my hand though. So, um, you know, it, to my understanding, I think that most of the Torah, at least, was written during the Babylonian Exodus. I think that's the case, and it was based on oral tradition, and. Given, given the concepts within the, the continuing Jewish tradition of taking these things as sort of, uh, as the statement was, like a, a form of abstract art, you know, it, it, it just seems to me that that might not be the case. These, that, that, that the people writing in Babylon, uh, just before they, they were released to go back to uh, Judea, or sorry, that's the Roman term, uh, go back to Israel, um, you know that that they would have said, yeah, no, these are our traditions, and not necessarily the case, and all of these other things. So, I don't know. But right, but, but Nick, before you before you say one anything, one of the things that we need to understand about hold on, the text hold on just itself. a second. I'm not trying to be rude. I need to say as the producer that that we need to give this about five more minutes, and then and then we need to to end the program. 
Okay. You know, one thing that we have to admit to, these people were making a language and also creating, if you will, a writing system. When you look at the Old Testament, you're looking at not just Hebrew, but you're looking at First and Second Temple Hebrew and also a mixture of Aramaic in it. And so these people are struggling, evolving, if you will. And so what we do have that is uh, something that's tangible is not, not an autographer of any kind. We're talking about something that's quite distant. But with that said, if you have no vowels and you simply have consonants, and number two, if it is a nominal language, and I don't know if you know what a nominal language is, it, you really don't have to have verbs. Verbs are actually unstated and implied and this is a very difficult thing to learn if you're not um, savvy, if you will, uh, to that kind of structure. And this, these texts have been pointed, as I stated earlier, in four different ways. And please understand that the Protestants rejected, for the most part, and made arguments to the church that the model of the Masoretic text, which is the latest pointing system, it was completely wrong. And every Protestant, every famous Protestant, I should say, practiced revocalization. That is, so they could shape the theology. And so when you do the work, that is, of a linguist and look at the facts, you find revocalization that was going on prior to the days of Jesus. And so why do we find such widespread revocalization of the text if the vowel pointings are not significant, that is, in understanding the text? Right. Now, we had at least 25 different scholars that argued with the church that we should never accept any of the pointing systems, and it was very unclear, and yet the church said we can have an accuracy model. And once again, I claim that the church has been lying to us in more ways than one. And I, I have a problem with saying that we actually understand any of the text. I, I can admit that we do understand to a certain degree the oral transmission, which is a completely different model. For instance, the Septuagint wasn't based upon a translation of the objad. It was based upon the oral tradition of the objad. Completely different thing. And so it's like going to an art museum and simply interpreting abstract art. And so how, how can we legitimately say that it's something different than that? Well, well I'd argue so. that you're, you're kind of the, putting the cart before the horse, though, and saying that we should be basing it on the, the abjad versus the oral tradition. The Septuagint would be, in my opinion, more accurate because I think that anything that is written down more accurate would based come upon what premise? after the, the uh, oral tradition. That the oral tradition was obviously the foundation for the abjad, so anything no. that dif or differs from the oral tradition would be... A, I mean, that's, that's sort of the true canon, is the oral tradition. The, the tradition of the Jew was simply to write down the consonants to allow people to have more of a linear theology. In other words, if I'm wrong, doggone, you can change as you will. And so there was an intent, that is, in putting things in abjad form. And this has been a practice of the Jews for many years, and this is why they keep an abjad. And they are not for the quote-unquote pointing systems that uh, do our, that are extant. And so my point is, let's just, for the sake of argument, let's take an author of one of the books. Why does he write down something that no one can actually understand that is without any vowel pointings? How can you understand the intent of any author without vowels? Even Martin Luther was smart enough to argue that there's no one who could understand anything about any language without vowels. The same thing is true with John their, Owen. In their own culture, that there there was a certain, particularly if you if you were more familiar with the words and the way one word could flow into another. I mean, uh, 
uh, what was that sentence? Like, can you remember? Colorless green, um, whatever. It's a nonsense sentence, but it flows, uh, and you can't reverse the words or rearrange them, and you, you'll or you lose the flow. There was a flow to the language that I think that those who spoke it natively could read the abjad and probably have a great deal more success at that than we do. But we coming from outside, not having anybody who speaks it natively to really uh, connect with, we're lost in a way that I don't think they were. So you don't think that people were lost with the concept of an abjad? I, not as lost as we are. I, uh, and it's possible that some of these writings were written in a manner where the person who wrote them, uh, you know, could read them. They know what they meant when they wrote that down. And that uh, it's possible some of these earlier texts were indeed personal notes. But when you look I, at the textual evidence, you have to the reworking of the text so many times. I, comes down. I can't see how that could be, uh, you know... Uh, all right, gentlemen, we have uh, one more minute at best, so let's get our final comments in, and then uh, we're going to have to wrap up. Yeah. I'd love to continue the, the hangout afterwards, so anybody else who'd like to join the conversation, I'll keep it up and running for a while, and we can continue the conversation going. Uh, but uh, that's that's another part of the, the concept here. We want you to be a part of what we're doing and to be a part of the conversation, not just watch what we're doing. Interaction is what the New Covenant Group is for. Well, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for coming to the place. This is a place for intellectual, spiritual, and scriptural honesty. And it's always nice to have people who are capable of respecting one another. And I want to give each and every one of you guys time enough to make a quick yeah. uh, final thought. Let's try to and take let's start with Daryl. 15 to 30 seconds, please. Hold on just a minute. Your mic is off or we, we've turned you down. Just a second. Okay, it's you, Daryl. Daryl, we can't hear you. We can't hear you, Daryl. Can't hear you. Try the other one. Hmm. hmm. All right, let's let's uh let's let's go to uh, someone else. Daryl, see if you can figure out what's going on with your sound. We Dennis. have Waylon here. Um, let's go to Ariel. Ariel, any final comments? <clears throat> um, my question, what the value of, if assuming that the Bible is a mythology, can we actually derive any better value from that um, premise? And I believe it does have value and that it may challenge some Christians to rethink the absolute stance or to start to question their own understanding of it. Having said that, I do believe that it, more often than not, except for the odd, you know, crazy, inexplicable event, um, does tend to my ears to have the sound of someone who's intending to write historically. That's great, my two cents. Great comment. Bob, any final comments? I, I think it's a, an issue worth looking at that no matter what we have said or what we conclude, we are certainly recognizing that um, we got some problems with the text. And I, I, I think regardless of how we conclude uh, uh, you know, what, what it actually is, uh, I think we're left in the mud in many ways. I agree with you. Very good. Dennis, anything? My last comment will be, I think that um, Christianity really need to rethink what they've been taught and what they actually believe. Uh, because if they think it's a mythology, they are think there are a lot of things are taking too literally too far. Yeah. Very good. Greg? Um, I, I actually just want to reiterate what Ariel said, that I think that the reason I make this point is because I think it adds value to the Bible and and it is a better way to consider the Bible. Now, I'll grant you that Joey pinned me down to making sure that I included all as so therefore we treated each book equally and we weren't addressing each book individually. But um, I, I think overall we get more value by considering the Bible as mythology than as anything else. And again, under the anthrop or anthropological understanding of that term. Very good. Uh, 
Um, Nick. So, I mean, I, I pretty much agree with Greg. I think that um, I think the Bible is an extremely uh, valuable thing. I think that we are, uh, in Christian terms and in religious terms, very blessed to have it. And that the window that it gives us on ancient ideologies and anthropology and mythology and all of these things is so important and we are very lucky to have this resource um, and I think that if we treated it in the, the way that it deserves to be treated in that sense I think that we could get so much more from it than what we are getting from it if we treat it in a literalist uh, conception very good Troy. Um, I mean, for me, this is mostly a listening and learning sort of experience. You were talking about stuff that I don't really have a whole lot of uh, background on. So I was mostly trying to absorb rather than speak out. That's a, pretty much all I got right now, unless you, you want to get argument. You, 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 you're just going to abandon. Love the, you're, you're, love the sweatshirt. You're, you're just going <laughs> to abandon your, your atheist teammate. Uh, <laughs> very good. All right. Uh, uh, before, uh, I'm going to let uh, our... Um, we're going to take a big risk here. I'm going to let uh, our friend Waylon, uh, who has just joined the conversation, have the last word. But before we do that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to, to Daryl to see uh, if his sound is working. Daryl, is your sound working? All right. Determine I, anything. Ah, that your sound oh, ah, is now working. Hey, there was. Was that, uh, was that our fault, Ricky? Okay, your sound is working. Final comments, Daryl. Oh, your sound has gone again. I don't know what's going on. I'm very sorry uh, uh, to our Texas studio. I send our uh, deepest apologies. I don't know if it's our fault or yours. Um, just uh, wave hi and stick your thumbs up, and uh, and uh, we'll have to get your comments another time, Daryl. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we love you so much. <laughs> all right. He did this uh, to you on purpose, Daryl. Uh, all right, uh, Wayland. Joey can't be trusted. Wayland, uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's unmute our, our new guest, Greg, in case you've muted him. I well, I, I just, I just jumped into the conversation, so I, so I really don't have any idea what's going on. But <laughs> my opinion of the uh, Holy Bible is, it's, it's a great form of uh, mythology, and I really think that we can understand a lot of uh, what ancient ideology and whatnot is from that. And I think it gives people a great moral basis. But I think that we should evolve from that. Very good. Mm -hmm. I like that comment. Uh, and uh, I am super jealous of your hair. <laughs> uh, Julie, aren't you just super jealous of hair? Uh, well, yes, but most especially Waylon's hair. I love, I love his hair. Matt, what do you think of Waylon's hair? It is awesome. <laughs> All right, and with that, uh, we are going to have to uh, to end the show. Uh, I can't stay any longer, unfortunately. I can't even join the hangout after the show is over. But if you would like to join uh, a future hangout, uh, um, write us at info at newcovenantgroup.com. Uh, or, um, That's just, my son. Just let us know on, on Facebook um, at, uh, at Kine or the or the or the New Covenant Group. Dr. Jones, did you have any final comments before we end this show? I did. Uh, I hope that people uh, will go to Bob Graves' uh, blog site and read what he wrote this morning if you don't find it there or if you can't find his blog site uh, go to the unconventional pastor on facebook or come to our page kind of Diothike, and read it it's a wonderful write w-r-i-t-e uh, he did a wonderful job and uh, i really really enjoyed that and bob i really enjoyed your thoughts uh, concerning in that particular day and time it's possible uh, to use consonants alone if you have some kind of paradigm working, but it, it's not going to be um, a workable language that can last uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, just exactly. past a few people. And, and so you know that argument is very valid, and I appreciated your points. Uh, but I agree with you. It is extremely muddy and... Uh, maybe I shouldn't have brought it back to the the text itself, but I, I think that sometimes we lose sight of what the intent was of these original authors, and in my opinion, they are lost. 
And so I, it's, it's difficult for me to say, oh, it's all mythology or all X, Y, or Z, simply because if you lose something and you can't bring it back, you know, you, you've got major problems. And it's not just lack of vowel points. Uh, it's we don't have the indexical and didactic elements to establish right. any of it. And so uh, from the standpoint of linguistics, I, I find that it's almost futile. And, uh, however, we do have something that came to us by oral transmission and however many times it changed no one knows and so uh i do enjoy having these kind of discussions i think they're very meaningful but i think it would be wrong for us to make these hardcore you know absolute conclusions like the church mm -hmm. does about the text the discussion continues uh um, nobody won. I mean, if you were to uh, to kind of uh, sort of sort of pick a winner, I think that um, you might might pick me. But uh, but I'm not I'm not judging. Um, in, in any case, uh, we love everybody and we had a good time, and that's the point. Um, but we are gonna have to go now. And uh, and as we go as we go out, I want to play a little music. And instead of our curtain for a few seconds, I want to get Daryl from our NCG studios to give us some sign language as we close. Uh, we will see you Sunday. Uh, we broadcast from uh, from 10:30, uh, 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 or excuse me, from uh, from uh, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, and so, uh, join us then. All right, let's enjoy some of that. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> that is a beautiful piece. I, I need to put Casey to bed now. I'll be back. We're gonna keep we're gonna keep the the Google thing going, right? <laughs>